Well, tonight, um, I was going to work on my uh, kingdom government messages, and, um, but the Lord said, no, we need to talk about what's going on right now. So this is going to be a little different, but as we know, it's always different, right? So this time, rather than basically doing scriptural teaching, which I'm, I'm more comfortable with, I just want to talk about some of the things that are going on so that we can see what's really happening out there Get in sync and understand that the Lord talk to you. It is a time to watch and pray. It's a time that you don't want to miss. Because you understand we're all in kingdom school, right? You know Jesus is coming back and he's trying to right now sort out who he's going to put in what position as he sets up his government to rule and reign over this earth that's going to desperately need a king. Can you see that's happening? And can you see that you're being trained and equipped because he's, he's showing you what's really going on even now so that you can learn and prepare for your position in the kingdom. A lot of people see prophecies and they say, this will never happen, this will never happen. But they always assume that the prophecy is going to take place while you're here, not after when he returns. Because, you know, we're going to be back here to straighten out a whole lot of stuff. We're in college right now. This is not the, the, this is not the real thing. The real thing is when Christ returns and sets up his eternal kingdom. And he's looking for those people to rule and reign with who will be by his side, who will be his bride. And that's what all this is about right now. So, you, I mean, he wrote a book about it and explained it all. And we're basically living out that book, right? I mean, you all got the book, right? And we've read the last chapter, so we know how it comes out. But remember, the last chapter is the revelation. It's not the disaster. It's the revelation of Jesus Christ. It's, if that's what it takes to wake people up and to tell the stories that will be told for eternity. Because you understand that once the devil's bound, people are not going to have a clue of what's really going on. They'll be coming to you. Because, you know, there's, everybody out here has got a book up in heaven, right? I mean, the, it's being written for you right now. And those books will be made into movies and who knows what else because t people are not going to believe what's going on right now. But we're going to live through it and we're going to watch it, we're going to see it, and we're going to experience it. And we're going to be a part of the overcoming plan of the Lord. And so that's why I wanted to go through some of the things that just seem to be happening right now. So I call this Watch and Pray for Spring of 2024 that you need to watch and you need to pray, and the Lord needs to put on your heart the thing that you need to pray for. We, no one person here is going to be able to handle all the mess that's going on. But He is going to put something on your heart, and you need to stand on the wall and deal with it. Take the authority the Lord has given you, because I'm, 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 our plan is to rule and reign with Him for eternity, and I think now would be a good time to start. Because I think that's what He's trying to do to show us. So, uh, my key scripture, Matthew 24, 33. So you too, when you see all these things, recognize that he is near right at the door. So it didn't say some of these things. It said all these things. So in other words, when all these things start coming together at the same time, pay attention. Because that means he's training and equipping us for something special. And also you understand that this is the time when you build your rewards which are necessary for what's going to be going on in the eternal position that you have. Yes, you do not get a, a kingdom bank account statement once a month that tells you how you're doing. But trust me, you are building treasures in heaven for a specific purpose and a specific time. So this is, this is college. Pay attention. There will be a test on this. So let's take a look at some of the things. Uh, I'll be talking about what's on the, this first screen here a little later. So... Um, God does expect us to understand the times and seasons. Jesus mentioned this. In the, this is in uh, Matthew 16, 3. And the Pharisees and Sadducees came, and to test him, they asked him to show them a sign from heaven. And he answered them, When it's evening, you say it'll be fair weather, and the sky is red. And in the morning, it'll be stormy today, for the sky is red and threatening. So you know how to interpret the appearance of the sky, but you cannot interpret the signs of the times. And an evil and adulterous generation seeks a sign, but no sign will be given except the sign of Jonah. Remember Jonah? Basically saying to Nineveh, hey, you know, you're going to get destroyed unless you repent. Pay attention. So 
what's going on is we got to understand that, yes, we do uh, pray and we do seek and he shares things with you. But it doesn't mean that he doesn't expect you to know what's going on. He, he needs that context and he'll use that in the situation. So, yes, we should be paying attention to what's going on. And yes, we should understand what he's talking about and what's going on. Because this is a, a, a critical moment. So God does expect us to understand what's going on. But understand, he's talking about Jonah, which was a time of judgment. And I believe that's where we are. So we're going to just go down a list of what's going on by, by some calendar dates. And whatever seems to talk to you, I think that's God. So I'm going to start with the fact that February 29th was leap day, right? We know that. Every four years we have a leap year. And, of course, we had an extra day. What is that day for? It's because when we put our calendar together, we fit it together really nice, but it doesn't line up with God's plan. So we've got to add in a little intervention to shift back and say, okay, let's line up with the way things really are that God created them. So we created something called a, a leap day to sort of do our best to level all that out. God didn't make a mistake. He basically put in, okay, you're going to need to make an adjustment here. Well, it turns out that not only was it our leap day, but it's all leap year, but it's the leap year for the Jews also. As you see, March 11th to April 8th is 8R2. Usually there's only 8R. But uh, at a certain schedule, they actually throw in an extra month, the 13th month, because their calendar is only 354 days. And that just happens to be happening right now. So there's a, a correction going on between what man's plans are and what our plans are. And it's interesting because uh, we'll see as we get into things like um, eclipses that the, the Jews and, the, and Islam basically goes by a lunar calendar. But we go by the, a solar calendar. So there's actually a little bit of a shift here. And, of course, there's a reason that they're more in the lunar and we're in the solar. So we'll take a look at that. You, you, as you can see, one's a reflected glory. Well, we also look, and it just so happens simultaneously, that Ramadan is actually at the same time also. So all these things are occurring all simultaneously right now. They don't just always do that. It just so happens that everything just seems to be lining up because the Jewish 13th month doesn't occur every four years. It occurs on a special schedule. And Ramadan moves around all over the place as it follows the, the moon. So pay attention. There's a correction that's going on right now. So something is out of the norm. It's shifting. Pay attention to that. And if we go on and we look at the, starting on March 23rd is Purim, uh, which is a celebration of the Jews saved from the destruction plot in the book of Esther. So this is coming up right now, which is Saturday night, which I believe is the night that um, Alan is speaking at Ron, Ron's meeting. Isn't that Saturday night, the 23rd? Well, that's also this Purim. And the interesting thing about it is it's a story that really is about the church, right? There's a government official named Mordecai who's being threatened by another government official named Haman because Haman wants to do evil things and take over, right? But Mordecai goes to who? The bride, the church, the one who's being prepared for the king and says, hey, um, we're all going to perish, and you're going to perish with them because they're going to come after you. Not just me, they're coming after you. You may have heard that from some politicians. It's not just me they're coming after, they're going to come after you too. I'm just in the way. Well, that's exactly what's going on. So Esther says, okay, well, I don't know. If I go up there, the king, I may die. But it was for such a time as this, if I die, I die, but it's my turn to stand up, and maybe the king will put his scepter out. Well, that's what the story is about. Are we in that situation right now? Is the church ready to step up? Is it for such a time as this? That the church that's been prepared, that you people who have been prepared, just like me, are we going to step up? You think the scepter will be, least, will be uh, extended for us? I do. 
But I think we need to do it. If we perish, we perish. But I think it's our time. So this is an important time, once again, for judgment. And it just so happens that even though this Purim is happening, the very next day, actually, is when the lunar eclipse happens. And remember, the lunar deals with the, the Jews. So these things are right together. And it's called a prenumbal eclipse across North America. And this, this eclipse basically is when the sun blocks is blocked out by the earth, so the moon gets darker. And that's sort of the, the scene that we're having. So it is actually a full lunar eclipse that's happening, and we see it right here in America. So let me see if I got, oh yes, I do. This is in Atlanta. You can see there's an area there that sees, could see the full, uh, the pre lunar eclipse. So something's going on here. Eclipses are an important thing that happened in the, the, the signs in the heavenlies are out there. Now, God has been speaking to a lot of us about this. We have a, uh, I think many of you know that we have a prophetic council, which meets on, on Thursday mornings. And I didn't go out and just look for information. What happened was, all of a sudden, a lot of our people from all over the place were beginning to share warnings and things about the stuff that's coming. So it caused me to do this message. It's because we were hearing this from people, prophets that say, hey, there's a warning of some things coming. We need to be paying attention. So that's why I basically put this together. It's not, hey, I'm looking at this thing and let's go ask God. God's already speaking. And I believe that he's already been speaking to you all too. So I'm just trying to bring it together to show a little context of what's happening. So that's happening the, really the next day because, as you know, uh, the uh, Purim is... Uh, 23rd through the 24th, and then the 24th through the 25th is the lunar eclipse. As just a strange situation. Purim, uh, it turns out there's been prophecies of all things about when the Chiefs win the Super Bowl. And this is just one of the strange things that happened. It turns out the day after Purim, when they won back in 2020, is when the COVID was announced as to be a, uh, a pandemic. It's when COVID came. Well, and then, uh, well, when the Chiefs won in 2023, the day after the Silvergate Silicon Valley, the largest collapse of bank and loss of capital occurred the day after Purim. So it just so happens that, well, they won again. And the day after Purim just happens to be the lunar eclipse. Important? Ask God if he's talking to you this is, I'm just laying out some things that the Lord can show you. Is there significance to these things? So let's take a look at some of the other things that are going on. And by the way, these are opportunities for the enemy. You understand that, right? You understand that even if God did not intend something to happen, is there not an enemy that will take advantage of situations? And so we've got to pay attention to what's going on because we've been getting warnings to say, hey, there's something going down. Well, if we look at the lunar eclipse, we also notice that just in a couple, four more days, we have Good Friday. Now, that's when, of course, we honor the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross. But it's, strangely enough, that happens to line up with the Shabbat Par. Well, that Shabbat is actually the Shabbat of the red heifer sacrifice. And it's when the red heifer is to be sacrificed. And I don't know if you're familiar, and we'll talk a little bit about the, the red heifer. But the red heifer, in a way, is sort of a typology of Jesus because it's used for cleansing of sin. And it's what's necessary to cleanse to be able to do the temple, to rebuild the temple. And that was the one piece that was missing because they knew it was not ready for the temple because they didn't have a red heifer. So they've been waiting for a red heifer for about 2,000 years. Well, it turns out that sure enough, as you might guess, it's, it came about. Not only did it come about, but a strange thing has happened here because this Hamas spokesman, Abu Abeda, actually came out and said after a hundred day into the war out there in Gaza, this is what he said, one confounding yet eye-opening proclamation escaped the headlines. 
listing the motives of the Palestinian militant group's October 7th massacre in Israel, he accused the Jews of bringing red cows to the Holy Land. The cows he was talking about are the red heifers, which now graze at a secure, undisclosed location in the Israeli-occupied West Bank, which is basically uh, uh, Judah. Some Jews and Christians believe they're the key to rebuilding the Jewish temple that once stood in Jerusalem and, and to beckoning the Messiah. They actually quoted the fact that they brought these the red heifers over to Israel, knowing that there's a purpose and a time. He actually said that's the real reason that we attacked Israel. We had to stop what was going on. And they were willing to sacrifice all the people in Gaza if they could get something going that's going to stop this situation because of that apparently afraid of what's going to happen. So there's got to be some significance to this. So also we can take a look at this. This is from the 26th of September in 22, an article on the red heifers. Last week, five red heifers arrived by airplane in Israel. And that was in September 16th, 2022. The one-year-old female calves were bred and raised on a ranch in Texas solely for the purpose of producing red heifers that could be used in the purification rituals in Jerusalem. To meet Jewish rabbinical standards, the cows must have no more than two non-red hairs. They got a lot of hair, too. <laughs> must not have been used for any work and must have no blemishes, including no brands or ears punctured by tagging. So... Basically, the Temple Institute set a group over there, and they came up with five of these. And they were, brought them back to Israel, and that's what this is about. But it turns out that at this point, they were calves because they were a year old. And they aren't considered heifers until they're two years and a day. So the possible sacrifice when they become two years and a day. So you want to add it up. Two years in a day after September 16th brings them into September of 2023. So that's when they first are able to use them in the sacrifice. But of course, that was not the day of the sacrifice of the red heifer. But what it when is? Well, it's Good Friday. Same day. So that sacrifice just happens to line up with the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, and it just happens to be for the purification of sin. And all this is happening on the same day. It doesn't happen on the same day, usually. That's not the way it plays out. It, the reason these things are happening at these times are these little interspersed 13th month and the actual leap year or leap day. All of those things are allowing these things to line up absolutely perfectly as we get back on God's plan, exact time. So this goes through Numbers 19. It talks about this role of the red heifer and why they couldn't really cleanse the temple and prepare for the, uh, for the new temple until they had this. And it says, um, preparatory actions can then be taken by rabbis in Israel in relation to the ritual sacrifices and perhaps even the rebuilding of another temple. However, in order to fulfill Bible prophecies about the cessation of the daily sacrifices on or near the temple. Now notice it didn't say that the sacrifices had to be in the temple. Because in Ezra it says only an altar is needed to begin the sacrifice. So if we're waiting for the temple to be built to say, wait a minute, these things can't happen. Daniel 9.27 cannot be fulfilled because we don't have a temple. Not necessarily true. Ezra says it this way. When the seventh month came and the Israelis had settled in their towns, and, the, and uh, this is sort of the first, the head of the year, then Joshua, son of Jehozadak, and his fellow priests, Zerubbabel and Shethiel, and his associates began to build the altar of the God of the Israel to sacrifice burnt offerings on it in accordance with with what the written law of Moses, the man of God, said. So in other words, what's happening is this is when they were restoring Israel and, and uh, Jerusalem and the temple. But they didn't have a temple yet. But it didn't matter because it says 
they began to offer burnt offerings to the Lord, though the foundation of the Lord's temple had not yet been laid. So if you're waiting for the temple, don't. All they had to do was build an altar to start the sacrifices. And remember, it just says the holy place. It didn't say necessarily the temple. So this can happen. If they sacrifice this red heifer on the same day as Good Friday, that, something big is going to happen. If, apparently, Israel's already been attacked because of these cows. So you can imagine what's going to happen. And they're looking, of course, at what might happen on the Temple Mount. But it can also happen outside of that. It needs to be theoretically near the temple. But it doesn't have to be on that spot. So we need to pay attention. Interesting things are happening. So how does this relate to Daniel and the 70-week the prophecy that we talked about? Well, I want to look a little bit about this. And because there's some interesting possible ways of looking at this that may be a little different than we have in the past. He says, 70 weeks have been decreed for your people in your holy city to finish the wrongdoing, make an end of sin, make an atonement for the guilt, bring in everlasting righteousness, seal up the vision and the prophecy, and anoint the most holy place. Once again, it's the most holy place. And so you know and understand that from the issuing of the decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem, there will be seven weeks and 62 weeks. So it's about 70 weeks, right? And we're going to look at this. It's an interesting thing. But I want to also look that there's a, um, there is a man that has been doing some research on this that we'll talk about. So I just want to keep your mind open that, yes, we're going to be looking at the 490 years, right? Because 7 times 70 would be 49, 490 years. And since we're short 7, that would be the 483. Well, theoretically, people have come up with a way to say, okay, that was Jesus, because it fits. Because it says, after 62 weeks, the Messiah will be cut off and have nothing. And the people of the prince who is to come will destroy the city and the sanctuary. The end will come with a flood. Even to the end, there will be wars and desolations. So there's two ends here. One is the end of that situation, but there's the end we're facing now, 2,000 years later. So the general thought is, okay, there's that last seven years. This one's already been done, the 483, but there's another seven years that we call the tribulation stuck out there somewhere. And he will confirm a covenant with many for one week. That's that seven-year tribulation, is what it's called. In the middle of the week, he'll put a stop to the sacrifice and the grain offerings. So the sacrifice has to be done at some point. But when you say put a stop to it, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's been going on for a long period of time. If, let's just say the Jews say, okay, we're going to start sacrifices. And we're going to start them on the altar. I mean, can you see Peter showing up? Can you see the whole world saying, no, we're not going to do animal sacrifices? Well, that would put a stop to the sacrifices. So we don't have to necessarily assume that these sacrifices have been going on for a while. It just means that, no, we're not going to do this. So there's, there's things coming that could happen immediately. And I was just trying to show you that. So in the middle of the week, he'll put a stop to the sacrifice and the grain offering. On the wings of abomination will come one who makes desolate until a complete destruction, one that's decreed, gushes forth on the one who makes desolate. And we know that's the Antichrist, right? Well, Jesus, of course gave validation that that had not happened yet, right? I know we say, well, that already happened. You know. Yes, but even if it did happen then, it's going to happen again. Because Jesus is saying, hey, this is going to happen. Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel standing in the holy place, let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains, and let him who is on the housetops not go down and take anything. In other words, get out quick because bad things are going to happen. Now, he says in Judea, which is the West Bank in general, and parts of Jerusalem. So you can see that something's going to come because this is Matthew 24. And you know a lot of Matthew 24 hasn't happened yet. So there is a second time here. Christ is coming back again. So if we look at these prophecies, there's a situation of, well, wait a minute. 
with everything was fulfilled here? No, there's part of it that's here too. So there's two situations, two returns of Christ. So there's a man named Dr. Christian Widener. I don't know if you guys have seen some of his teaching. He's, a, he's actually an engineer. But he, um, he's done a lot of research on this, and he's, I encourage you to evaluate it by your own spirit and say, is this stuff true? And he has uh, written a book, Witnessing the End, and it's uh, available free on PDF if you go to his website. But he's also done some research on where the, the actual temple was, and he believes, I believe, that it's on the Dome of the Spirits, which is what's in the next picture over there. That small little covering is the actual uh, where the um, where the threshing floor was, and that is directly aligned with the east gate where Christ is supposed to come into. So he says, "Hey, we could do this without taking down the El the Elos Mach, the, the big dome of the rock." And so you can see where all of this is coming together. If they would start this over this red heifer, can you see that we may be focused on an incredible battle very, very quickly? That some of this stuff can happen pretty quick. So, if we look at all this stuff, but hey, wait a minute. Now, it's not that time yet, right? So, because we've been looking at that here, looking and seeking God, that one of two things is going to happen. We are either coming directly into the revelation of Jesus Christ, with the reading of Him, which is basically the story in the Revelation, and that we're in that time, or we're at the time of the revealing of the bride, which means that we are going to overcome. And we are there to raise ourselves up so that he comes back for a glorious bride. Now, we believe here from just talking to God, I think we all seem to believe that this is the revealing of the bride that he's been encouraging us that now's the time to stand and to fight and to overcome. And that God has a plan of victory. But the patterns that he have repeat. Biblical patterns repeat. And so the pattern that we're in right now will look just like the return of Christ. At least most of it will. But it doesn't mean it's that pattern. We saw that, you know, that pattern uh, back before. Um, at, so there's different patterns that have repeated in the Bible. So I'm not surprised that if we follow the things that we've seen, which look a whole lot like the Revelation, we're saying, well, does that mean that Christ is coming now? Or is that the typology of the pattern? And the enemy is trying to pull his power into now. But we're saying, no, it's not the time of that. Because when Jesus shows up, it's over, people. The door is closed. But that's not the case if it's for the revealing of the bride we'll see a great revival if it's the bride. So that's where we are. So the enemy is trying to pull it up and say, no, this is it. And we're saying, no, this is the revealing of the bride. That time will come, but it's not now. And so that's where we are. We, so far, I still believe that this is the time of the revealing of the bride. And, but this man does have some thoughts, and so I want to reveal a couple of those things. He's basically saying, look, there's actually, in, if you look at the story here, there's two revealings and two returns here. Christ shows up, and we, we do the 69 weeks. But on the second time when he shows up, we're going to start over, and we're going to do another 70 weeks. And if you look at the, the way this thing is all laid out, you'll see that there's pieces of this that say, wait a minute, there is another 70 weeks coming here. Well, if that's true, when does that 70 weeks start? Well, it starts with the decree to rebuild the temple. What well, just so happens that Suleiman the Magnificent, the Ottoman ruler, actually went out and rebuilt Jerusalem. And he gave a decree to do it and put it on a plaque that's up there. And he rebuilt the city of Jerusalem, including the walls and the Tower of David and all the gates, except for the one, of course, which was the eastern gate that Christ is going to go through. 
the eighth gate, the golden gate, the gate Jesus now is, is basically going to come through. They didn't rebuild that, but they did put a, um, uh, a cemetery outside of it, believing that the Jews wouldn't cross, you know, they can't walk through a cemetery. So that's why if you ever go, you'll see a, a cemetery right outside of the eastern gate. To preclude the Messiah right, from entering Jerusalem. That'll work. <laughs> so this Solomon the Great, or the Magnificent, rebuilt the entire city just like it said. The, there was, so now there's another decree to rebuild the city. Besides what happened you know, with Ezra and Nehemiah and so on. But it, it occurred on 1537. So, but we know that there's another seven years that when the final return is, that's going to show up. So we're back to the 483, the 69 weeks. So how does that play out? Well, as it turns out, if you add up the 1537 and add 483, it comes out to 2020. That would mean that the seven years would start in 2020. Hmm. So, but for that to happen, there must have been some sort of a treaty that took place in 2020, right? Something that we would say. Now, we'd say it was dedicated at seven years. Well, if there's only seven years left, it's a seven-year treaty. So we don't, in other words, it, it would last that long. But so we know that Christ would probably return on Rosh Hashanah. We all believe that, right? That Jesus fulfilled the earlier feasts already, but his second time he's going to be for the fall feasts. So he's going to come probably around Rosh Hashanah. So that means it would have to be sometime in the later half of 2020, whatever this treaty or whatever was, with the midpoint being when? Spring of 2024. Hmm. Well, it turns out, of course, September 15, 2020, was the signing of the Abraham Accord. You remember what that was, right? Well, so we're looking at that, and it was signed, on the, sure enough, in September, the end of the year of 2020. So you're looking at that and say, well, maybe that could be it, because it is a treaty with many, because many people are beginning to sign on to the Abraham Accord. That, what if that's the actual treaty? So, and that's what he's saying. Hey, I just want to consider it. I'm not trying to say this is going to happen, but hey, consider this as a possibility. But remember, even if all these things line up and they look like the return of Christ, of course that's going to be happening because the prophetic patterns are there. Just, I mean, we're looking at an illustrated Bible, aren't we? I mean, buy or sell, the mark, the whole thing. I mean, it's right there. But he's saying, well, if this is the case, then that means Jesus is going to return in 2027. And you say, well, how can that be? Well, I don't know. When was Jesus crucified? Do we know? You say, well, maybe it's 33 A.D., right? Isn't that, therefore, he was born around zero. But we find out that, no, he wasn't born at zero because Herod wasn't around then. And all those things didn't happen, so he had to be born probably around Maybe, what, 4 B.C., something like that? So we don't know when the actual crucifixion was exactly. We don't know a lot of things in that time frame. But if we're just going to be at 2,000 years, and if you say, okay, well, let's look at um, 20, let's say, let's say it was 27 A.D. Well, if you had 2,000 years to that, what do you get? 2027. So you see how we're looking at time frames which seem to line up pretty interesting around here. And it, that literally, we don't consider the fact that a lot of these things could be happening right now in our midst. And whether or not this is the final or it's not, the images are there and we should be biblical and we should be prophetic people which read the signs and the times and respond the way the Lord wants us to. Because this is prophetic times, and if you want a prophetic result, you need to understand and you need to prophesy. So, this was September 2020. Now you say, well, if that's the case, then Trump's the Antichrist, right? 
But he wasn't the one who negotiated the treaties and put them together. It was Jared Kushner, right? Y'all remember that? You know that Jared Kushner was also the guy who managed to spend $1.8 billion to buy 666 Fifth Avenue, right? You know who he is. And you know you haven't heard from him, have you, lately? So there's a whole lot of things we don't know. But don't just make an assumption and say, wait a minute, I've got this. Trust me, I don't have it, you don't have it, we don't have it, but God does. And he's using it to get our attention so we can understand what's going on. And so we can pray the things that we need to pray. So I also went ahead and said, well, let's just look at this, the seals. Because if it starts in 2020, then we should be seeing the seals have at least started now. And of course, you know that I lined the seals up with the birth pains in Matthew 24 because they're basically the same thing, right? You all have seen how they say the same thing. So if we look at the, the horses, okay, we got the first horse, the white horse. Well, that would have happened in 2020. Well, it's interesting because it says he was given a crown, and that word crown is, guess what? Yeah, you guys are smart. <laughs> so could the white horse be our medical community <laughs> who out there and gave us, yes, the corona? So I don't know. But that's one of the things he's proposing. Could that have been the white horse? And we know the second one's a red one that takes peace from the earth, like wars and things like that, wars and rumors of wars. Maybe we had some of that. We go on to the third one, the black horse. And all of a sudden, there's famine. There's a, actually, a, all of a sudden, the prices start going up, a quart of wheat for a day's wages. Sound like inflation to you? So maybe there's inflation. And then the fourth one is sort of a summary of all these things which starts to bring death. People start dying after a period of time. Hmm. And notice that it talks about famines and earthquakes. So how could these things go together? Well, it just so happens. Let's continue on. And by the way, the fifth and the sixth seal, I'm believing that happens after the mid um, abomination of desolation. I'm hoping <laughs> that uh, they began to slay us for the word of God because that means he's got enough power to pull that off. And there's other scriptures about that. And then, of course, then we get another great earthquake. Sun turns black. The moon turns blood red, which, by the way, when the lunar eclipse happens, that the red happens to come in. As the moon gets darker, it can look like a blood moon. So anyway, we see a lot of interesting things. So that's part of this. Now, so we're at uh, Shabbat Para, the sacrificing of the red heifer. And then we have, of course, our Easter, celebrating the resurrection of Jesus. But then we go to April 8th when we happen to have a solar eclipse. And by the way, there just so happens to be something else we'll talk about called a devil's comet, which happens to be visible once the sun is blocked out by the moon, so now all of a sudden you see in the sky a horned comet. So it's very interesting, but we'll talk about that too. So anyway, the, uh, the solar eclipses it talks about, there was one in 2017 and another one in 2024. We know anything that happened in 2017? Maybe an election, well, a new administration comes in. Seven years, you know, I've talked about that, right? Well... So I look at this thing. So the crossing of the two solar eclipses happens right in Carbondale, Illinois. Now, one of our um, uh, prophetic team members went there uh, with Robin Bullock and some of the uh, prophets. And they've just gone to Carbondale and had an incredible meeting there um, about a week or two ago to pray. And they said the anointing was very powerful. But they went to that spot where these two came together. Why would they do that? Because... They believe that this is a strange situation to see this thing crossing right in the heart of America. A very unusual situation. And it crosses right at a place called Carbondale, which happens to be part of Little Egypt, which is in the bottom of Illinois. They call it Little Egypt. And uh, as a matter of fact, 
Cairo, Illinois, which, yes, they call it Cairo, even though it's spelled like Cairo, is right there because that's part of the little Egypt. So the fact that we got a crosshair on Egypt is a, I mean, hey, I'm sure it's coincidence. Well, it turns out the two um, eclipses were seven years apart almost, but if you look at the time day by day, it actually turns out to be six years, six months, six weeks, and six days between the two. And yes, you, I calculated that out because I didn't believe it either. But it's true. So could that mean something? Maybe. There's something going on here. These are all strange coincidences that they, when they're happening. It's happening on April 8th. Well, if you look at it, this is a sort of a more detailed picture of it. You're saying right there it is in Carbondale, and yes, that's little Egypt down there at the bottom. You can see sort of the, 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 uh, the Mississippi River. But there's something else that happens there. It turns out that this is, I overlaid two images directly on top of each other, and this is called the New Madrid Seismic Zone. You familiar with what the New Madrid Fault is? That's the fault that runs all the way from Canada all the way down to the Gulf pretty much down the Mississippi River, probably, maybe that's part of what created it, I don't know. But that fault, if it, if it erupts, would divide America in two. As a matter of fact, there's been prophecies about that. And so it just so happens that that's, uh, there's 100 miles between Carbondale and New, the center of the New Madrid Fault and Carbondale are about 100 miles apart, but as you see, it runs right up through there. So we got Egypt, we got a, a fault line, we got an earthquake. Now, if an earthquake happens there, can you see where a famine might occur? Because what would that take out? How about the bridges across the river? Railroad bridges, truck bridges. Where do you think a lot of our fresh food comes from? The people are in the east, but where are they getting their food? Yeah, California, Mexico, whatever, but it's come, it comes across this river. So can you see how earthquakes, all of a sudden, like we talked about earthquakes at the same time as famine, can you see how some things could happen here? Well, and by the way, during the eclipse is when this comet shows up, this Devil's Comet, they call it, 12P Ponds Brook. And it's called the Devil's Comet because it has little horns on it. And all of a sudden, it keeps getting brighter and brighter, and they can't understand what's going on with this comet, but it's coming toward us. It was first discovered in 1812. By the way, you know what else happened in 1812? No, that's actually when the... Um, <laughs> yes, there was a war. I, th I think I read about it. Um, I wasn't around, but, um, but that's also when the Madrid Fault erupted, was in 1812. So just... Coincidence, I'm sure, but that's when this thing's coming back, and it'll be in this. And you can't see it right now because of the sun. But once the sun is blocked out, supposedly it'll be one of the brightest things in the sky. So interesting, it just happens to appear. Uh, and by the way, there's something called a Madrid Conference. Since we're talking about you know New Madrid, are you familiar with what the Madrid Conference is? Well, it turns out in uh, March of 1991. George Bush went out and said, we've got to stop this Arab-Israeli conflict, so we're going to bring together and make a peace conference with uh, Bush and Miguel Gorbachev and some of these people and all of these people from these countries, and we're going to come up with a plan for peace for the Middle East. And it's called, yes, the Madrid Conference. And it's, so basically, beginning with the Madrid Conference in 1991 came the Oslo Accord, which officially divided the Palestinian land into three administrative divisions and created the framework of the Israel's, Israel's political borders with the Palestinians. In other words, you know, we got Gaza, we got the West Bank, and we got Israel. This is the dividing of the land. So we got the dividing of the land occurring in something called the Madrid Conference. So America is out there trying to force the Madrid Conference on Israel to divide their land. What could possibly go wrong? You're beginning to see the picture. Well, 
it turns out that, sure enough, uh, the two-state solution is the only answer. This is February 22nd, 2024. Because you see now the war that's been started is starting this back up again that we got to create this peace. So now they're starting to force the situation into Israel to divide the land. So can you see what's happening right now? This is the G20 group, nearly unanimous support for the two-state solution, divide God's land. And the Secretary General, United Nations, any refusal to accept the two-state solution by any party must be firmly rejected. 23rd of January, 2024, stressing the Israeli leader's recent, clear, and repeated rejection of the two-state solution is unacceptable. Someone needs to be paying attention, right? And by the way, I, I meant to include my scripture out of Joel, but you know what it says about uh, dividing the land? The answer is don't divide God's land. He, he, he mentions that in Joel 3, by the way, if you're familiar with that. And it says very clearly that you, uh, if you divide God's land, he will divide your land. Not a good thing. Oh, uh, Nathan, I got some audio on this one. So let me play this. This is from last week, I think. Let's see if I can get this to actually happen. Well... In order to achieve a two-state solution, the reality is that things must change. As a lifelong supporter of Israel, it has become clear to me the Netanyahu coalition no longer fits the needs of Israel after October 7th. The world has changed radically since then, and the Israeli people are being stifled right now by a governing vision that is stuck in the past. Nobody expects Prime Minister Netanyahu to do the things that must be done to break the cycle of violence, to preserve Israel's credibility on the world stage, and to work towards a two-state solution. I believe that holding a new election, once the war starts to wind down, would give Israelis an opportunity to express their vision for the post-war future. If President Net Prime Minister Netanyahu's current coalition remains in power after the war begins to wind down and continues to pursue dangerous and inflammatory policies that test existing U.S. standards for assistance, then the United States will have no choice but to play a more active role in shaping Israeli policy by using our leverage to change the present course. So what could go wrong? Find something to pray about yet? All of these things are happening. And by the way, you, you know it was another Bush who basically forced the situation in Gaza, right? That caused the, for, forcing the people of Israel out of Gaza. And they became homeless and they were standing on the tops of their roofs. Remember, I mean, you saw those pictures, and uh, as uh, as Alan was reminding me, it was what um, one or two days later, when all of a sudden the. Uh... Okay, um, John Kilpatrick of the Brownsville Revival, and he now uh, is the pastor of a church in Daphne, Alabama. He said the Lord told him specifically, and he gave a sermon about this, that when. George W. Bush forced the removal of 5,000 Jewish people from their homes. Do y'all know what happened the next day? Katrina. Katrina. And 500,000 Americans were pulled out of their homes. It was exactly half a million the next day. 
And so you sort of get the idea. You don't want to mess with Israel that way. So anyway, um, as you notice, April 8th, the devil comet appears. Also, the end of Ramadan happens. Things can happen on the end of Ramadan. And Nisan 1, which is the beginning of the Jewish year in the spring, is also on April 9th. And then we, of course, go to Passover. which And I know Passover sounds like a beautiful time, but remember what Passover is about? It's the death angel, folks. And it hit Egypt. Remember, where's the, what's it going to cross? Little Egypt? And the death angel came upon Egypt. And luckily, though, they had a plan, and that was the Passover. But that was judgment. All this is judgment. All these spring things were judgment. So finally, the devil's comment on June 2nd comes the closest to earth, and then we have Pentecost. So these are just some of the things that are happening. So Lord, we thank you. Just show us what we need to pray for and how we need to stand, Lord, in this time. So we thank you for this opportunity, Lord, to be a part and to understand what you're doing in this season, what may be the most dangerous time on the face of this earth about what's going on in our nation. And we have a front row seat. For some reason, we were born for such a time as this, even in a small little country like this compared to the world. And we thank you, Father, for giving us this uh, revelation, this time and this season to be one of the people who would love to have been around just to see your power and your glory. And Lord, we know that you're going to do something great and you're going to include us, but we want to be up for the task. Show us what to pray for and how to stand in this time, Lord, for your glory. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, thank you all.